Anyway, well, thanks for everybody for coming. Um, I want to talk today about, um, uh, well, first I should introduce myself. I'm Bob McBride. I'm the new director of the Office of Technology Development. Uh, we're the Tech Transfer Office, and uh, we're located over in the Torrey Pines building. Uh, but hopefully you'll see us around more and more. And uh, I'm always happy to talk to you about inventions you think you might have made or uh, some ideas you might have. Uh, or any questions or concerns you may have about how the process works or any ideas you may have for how we can improve it, I'm always glad to hear those. We want to really develop, my goal is to develop a, a tech transfer program here that is as equally remarkable as the science itself. And I think that there's a lot that we can do to, uh, to give real credence to the SALK model that this is where where cures begin. I think there's a lot that we can do. But um, I thought that for to kind of open the door for uh, what's going on in, in our office as well as elsewhere is to talk about why is academia seem to suddenly be so interested in patents. And I've been in the university tech transfer business uh, since 1985. And I've seen a, a, a continuous progression now, we started out in 1980. The tech transfer office was kind of, when it came to the university, we were kind of the last hair on the tip of the dog's tail. Most people didn't know we were there. Uh, people were a little bit curious as to why we had people who handled patents and inventions, because it really was not something people gave much thought to in academia. Uh, it was also kind of an interesting time, because nobody knew how to do anything. We knew very little about patents. And, when I got into it back in those days, uh, I didn't know anything about patents either. Uh, as time went on, though, uh, it became more and more of central interest to, uh, to universities. And today, I think it, it has taken a very big leap in just the last few years. And today, universities are actually uh, coming out, having university presidents and vice presidents for research are saying that technology transfer is equally important to our education and research mission. That there are really three missions, education, research, and technology transfer. A huge departure from the way things were in 1980. Where is this coming from? There are a number of reasons that we can point to that has led academia to take a much greater interest in patents. And one of them, and the one that has had the biggest impact in the last few years, is economics. The traditional sources of funding for uh, research are really not getting any better. And in fact, they're slowly declining, and it's becoming more and more difficult to, to support, let alone expand, research programs in academia. In contrast, royalty income is on the rise. And some te technologies have developed, have generated royalty income that is really transformative in its size and its impact. And of course, companies are increasingly interested in licensing academic technologies and funding research because of some of the changes in the way their industries work. Let's take a closer look at this. If you look at NIH funding over the last uh, um, 12, well, the last 10, 10 years and projecting in the future, the, uh, the appropriations for NIH are the gray bars. Um, and uh, it peaked in 2004, and it's been slowly going down uh, over time, which I think everybody is aware of and painfully aware of, that it, they're no longer the kind of increases. There was a time when the goal was to double the NIH budget in five years. Well, that, that doubling uh, was done with in 2003, and it's been kind of a slow erosion since then. Um, Endowments uh, at institutions that uh, generate revenues. Most institutions that have an endowment, they'll take four or five percent uh, of the endowment money and uh, use it to support internal programs, including research programs. But the size of those endowments uh, over the last few years has taken a major hit. I mean, these are some pretty prominent institutions, and you can see, for example, Harvard. Uh, lost about 30% of their endowment in the, in the stock market. Uh, and uh, uh, MIT lost 21%. So 
when your endowment's going down, again, it's, it's, it gives you fewer resources with which to support um, your research programs. Royalties, on the other hand, are, are trending up. Um, and there has been a, a general trend. These are, this is the total royalty income for all universities, uh, about 200 universities combined. And uh, you'll see a big difference between 2008 and 2009. And the reason is that in 2008, there was one technology that made a huge amount of money. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and if you look at the number of patent applications that are being filed by academic institutions, uh, you can see that there's been an upward trend there, and also in the number of invention disclosures that, uh, that faculty and students at, at academic institutions are disclosing to the tech transfer offices is going up. But here's the big reason why people's attitudes about tech transfer have changed so dramatically in the last few years. The, I used to talk about the number of institutions that were in the $50 million club. And it used to be a handful. Today, we talk about the $200 million club. And you know, the, uh, you look at City of Hope, which is not a big place. They only had 11 invention disclosures in 2009. But they had royalty income of almost $200 million. And I suspect that royalty income is bigger than their entire NIH funding for the year. Um, Columbia has been a, a uh, powerhouse of tech transfer for a very long time. This is actually a low point for Columbia. They're usually in the 200, 200 million range or better. Um, University of California, of course, this is system-wide income of 103 million. And quite frankly, considering the number of disclosures they had and the number of licenses they did, that's not all that impressive compared to some of the others. Uh, Wake Forest University has uh, a patent on a, uh, a vacuum wound closure device that's used in surgery. And um, much of the $95 million that they earned came from that invention. The, uh, one of the things that, that uh, is a fact of life in the tech transfer business is that you tend to get 80 or 90 percent of your revenue from two or three inventions. And all the other inventions put together make up 10 to 20 percent of your revenue. So it really is a game of home runs. But there have been some fabulous home runs. Uh, and these are some examples. Now, monetization is something that um, is becoming very popular with extremely valuable inventions. Basically, when you have a license agreement and you have the right to collect royalties every year, you can sell the right to collect those royalties to a company. And there's a company in Canada called Drug Royalty Corp. That that's the business they're in. They buy royalty streams. And uh, in 2008, uh, NWU sold their patent on uh, Northwestern University, sold their patent, patent royalties on Lyric uh, that was licensed to Pfizer for $700 million cash on the barrel hit. Now, the Salk Institute's research budget is just below $100 million. Can you imagine the impact if we suddenly brought in $700 million in one shot? Um, NYU has the patent on Remicade, which is an anti-TNF-alpha uh, antibody used to treat arthritis and other autoimmune diseases. Uh, they sold their royalty stream to, for $640 million. Emory had patent on uh, Mtriva, which is an HIV uh, drug uh, that's licensed to Gilead for $520 million. And Sloan Kettering sold their patent on Nupigen, cancer drug uh, licensed to Amgen, for $400 million. These have a dramatic impact. And this has really caught the attention of president's office and the boardroom of pretty much every academic institution in the, in the US, if not around the world. Um, reason number two that universities are suddenly interested in patents these days is uh, uh, the NIH roadmap, which really, through which NIH is really focusing uh, more efforts on translational research and getting drugs to the patient's bedside. Um, Foundations increasingly want a clear path to the patient's bedside. For example, the 
Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is very clear on this point. They want to know who your corporate partner will be. They want to know how your tech transfer office functions. And they're even willing to pay for patent applications that arise from, uh, from research that you do. And they're even willing to invest in startup companies that are going to bring that product to market. Companies, particularly drug companies, have downsized their R&D programs over the years so much that they don't have any basic research anymore. They don't do any discovery research. For a long time, they were depending upon biotech companies for new discoveries. But today, they're increasingly looking directly to universities for those new pipeline opportunities. Uh, and then there's also a patent cliff that is coming up very soon in 2012 where a great many of the valuable drug patents of pharmaceutical companies are going to expire. The uh, NIH roadmap uh, has a goal of accelerating the movement of basic research discoveries uh, into clinical practice. And uh, it explicitly focuses money on the roadblocks that slow the pace of research uh, that could ultimately improve public health. The, uh, the budget for the roadmap project is only 1% of NIH's budget, but it has impacted pretty much all of their grant programs. The R01s are still their biggest expenditure, but even in R01s now, they're starting to ask, OK, if you, if you are successful in this project, how's that going to impact the public health? The roadmap strategy includes, of course, the things that go on at the lab bench. But they're putting a lot of money into translational research programs, public-private partnerships for clinical development of inventions, and um, trying to get those into, the, into uh, humans, get them tested, get them refined, and get them to become therapies that can be used to improve public health. The uh, pharmaceutical companies face this patent cliff. Um, a third of the drugs on, on uh, important and profitable pharmaceuticals uh, the, today, the patents are going to expire by the end of 2012. Um, the biotech companies, in the meantime, uh, they're not going public. The um, big pharma has already bought those companies that, um, that they think had value. Um, they, Funding is very difficult. Initial public stock offerings are essentially zero in biotech today. And so Big Pharma is saying, well, where are we going to, we've acquired all the companies we thought were good. Where are we going to get more technologies to develop into drugs? And their inevitable conclusion is, we're going to have to take a look at inventions that are being made at universities. And we're going to have to look at perhaps funding the development of those to be our drugs of the future. And one of the things that we've started to see are some really big money pharmaceutical deals. Now, Scripps has had big money pharmaceutical relationships for many years, but um, they were the odd man out for a very long time, but it's becoming more common elsewhere. So for example, in September of 2009, Vanderbilt did a deal with Johnson & Johnson for developing schizophrenia drugs, in which they agreed to pay $10 million up front and uh, milestone fees of uh, up to $100 million, depending upon the success of products ultimately discovered. In May of 2010, Pfizer did a deal with the University of Washington uh, for um, looking for new uses for, for Pfizer drugs and uh, drug uh, candidates. Pfizer has a huge library of drugs that they've already sold and drugs that uh, were developed at some point in the past, but never commercialized. And so they're looking for um, opportunities to apply those same drugs for new therapeutic indications. And uh, that deal is Pfizer's putting up $22.5 million to fund that project. And University of Washington, together with the state, is going to match that to create a $50 million pool of funds for that project. And in November of 2010, Pfizer did a deal with UCSF to develop drugs for high important, highly important unmet clinical needs, which really have not been uh, defined with any particularity at this point. 
uh, and it includes up to $85 million to support research and in milestone fees on uh, the uh, sale of successful drugs. So this also, to attract these kinds of funding, you know, you've got to be in patent savvy and have intellectual property interests that you can use to attract them. Yeah. Question about the UCSF deal. Um, with respect to the unmet clinical needs, is there any kind of uh, market share component to what is high importance? At, you know, um, yeah. I think that they're, that's probably what high importance means. It has to be, they're, they're not looking for orphan drugs here. They're looking for things for heart disease, you know, uh, uh, cancer prevention, you know, things that are going to have a big market. Yeah. It's just a nicer way to say it. Well, I <laughs> they could have said big money <laughs> drugs, yeah, but that would have been quite as, quite as publicly palatable. Say high importance would be the number of people around the world who you would be able to benefit, but they might not have any money. Right. Yeah. So, so you know, it might be very important to come up with a better drug for malaria, but nobody's going to fund that project, unfortunately. Um, the third reason is that academia has an extremely good track record when it comes to inventing really revolutionary technologies. And this is a story that is not told often enough. Most people don't realize, for example, that insulin was first discovered by a university in Canada. Uh, vitamin D milk that eradicated rickets came from the University of uh, Wisconsin. Um, uh, the blood thinner Coumadin also came from Wisconsin. Uh, the pap smear, the pacemaker, almost everything in MRI technology came out of academia. CAT scans, uh, the, the uh, First production method for making human factory for treating hemophilia. Uh, Taxol, which we'll talk about a little bit more, is an extremely important anti-cancer drug today. Um, the polio vaccine, of course, is near and dear to our hearts. Fluoride toothpaste was developed at the uh, University of I think it was University of Iowa. Um, streptomycin was invented uh, at uh, Rutgers University by Selma Waxman, and it eradicated tuber tuberculosis. The hepatitis B vaccine, PET scans, PET CT scanners, plexiglass ultrasound, liquid crystal displays, cisplatin, Allegra, and of course, last but not least, the entire field of recombinant DNA was uh, covered by the Cohen-Boyer patent that was co-owned by Caltech at Stanford. Uh, there is a great track record, and there are many other inventions, hundreds of them, that are much more, many of which are newer than these, and are going to have as dramatic an impact on human health and on our economy as these did. Reason number four that universities are interested in patents these days is really an old reason, and it's the Bayh-Dole Act which was passed in 1980. It just had its 30th anniversary. And uh, it has an interesting uh, history. In the 1970s, Japan was, was basically reading our scientific articles, saying, wow, what a great idea. They would go and make the product and sell it back in the US market. And as a result, the, the US market uh, was pumping huge amounts of money into Japan and was not generating jobs in the United States. And so uh, the question was, how can we make a difference here? How can we change that paradigm? Well, Howard Bremer, who I think can fairly be called the father of academic tech transfer, Howard was a patent attorney at the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And uh, he was very frustrated because at the time, the law said that if the federal government funded your research, any inventions that you made were owned by the government. And the government would patent a very few of them. And they published them in a, in a book that was about as uh, readable as the New York White Pages. And very few of those inventions were getting licensed to industry and turning into products. So uh, Birch Bayh was a senator from Wisconsin that Howard approached and said, you know, there ought to be, you, I've, he, Howard had convinced NSF and uh, the health service at the time, to allow Wisconsin to retain ownership of some of the inventions so they could actually turn them into products more effectively than the government had. 
and had had some success at that. And so he convinced Birch Bayh, uh to write a bill that would allow universities and nonprofit research institutes and small companies to retain ownership of inventions even though they were made using federal research funds. Uh, Bob Dole uh, joined uh, from Kansas, the senator from Kansas joined in sponsoring that bill. And um, it uh, was widely viewed as a no-cost way to en enhance US industrial competitiveness uh, with respect to technologies that were coming out of academia. Uh, the Bayh-Dole Act was dramatically successful. Um, in The Economist in 2002, they declared that it was the most inspired legislation in a half a century. Um, it created an entire new industry. In 1985, which is when I got into tech transfer, I went to the annual meeting of the Society of University Patent Administrators, uh, which there were 35 people at the annual meeting. It was a very early time. Uh, in 2009, the annual meeting of uh, the same organization, which now is known as the Association of University Technology Managers, um, had over 2,000 attendees and has 3,500 members. It really has become a whole new profession and a whole new industry. Uh, the uh, Bayh-Dole Act also led to a, really a national movement to support faculty who wanted to start companies to develop their technologies, very often technologies that big companies would find too risky, but where the individual faculty inventors had a passionate belief of their abilities to succeed. And some of those companies have been dramatically successful um, such as Google. Uh, reason number five, uh, academic institutions have learned the ropes in, when it comes to patents and licensing. Uh, before the Bayh-Dole Act, there were very few institutions that had tech transfer programs. Uh, University of Wisconsin being one. Um, there was also a company called Research Corporation Technologies that if you had inventions that weren't made with federal funds, they would patent some of those and were successful in licensing some of them. Uh, Research Corporation is probably most famous for some of the inventions that decided not to uh, patent. Uh, for example, Bell Laboratories asked them if they would be interested in a patent on something called the laser. And, uh, and Research Corporation said, oh, we don't really see any use for it. It's just a lab curiosity. <laughs> I said, Foresight is very, uh, uh, is not often very accurate. Um, 30 years since the Bayh-Dole Act was passed, virtually every uh, significant research institution in the United States has at least somebody on their staff who's responsible for patenting and licensing of inventions that might be made. The collective experience and infrastructure for doing this has grown, grown tremendously. And um, uh, that has been, uh, not only in the national level, but at the local level. There's some very sophisticated tech transfer programs, some of which have very large uh, professional staff. And institutions are now defending their patents. A patent gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, or selling your invention in the patent country. But there's no patent police department that will go out and stop them. The only way you get to stop somebody from infringing your patent is you have to sue them in federal court. And universities are doing that. And uh, some are being quite successful. Um, I looked at, a couple years ago, I took a look, I found 126 patent infringement lawsuits that had at least one university as a, as a patent litigant. And uh, you can see this is quite a list of people who, of institutions that have been willing to go to court to fight for uh, the, their right to collect income from the value of their patents. And in many ways, the willingness of universities to litigate their patents has moved industry towards taking university patents more seriously and seeing them as uh, really becoming much more knowledgeable in the business of patents and licensing and led to increased willingness to license patents than we saw in the past. Um, reason number six, uh, it's perhaps not as dramatic a thing, but it, I think it's extremely important. 
uh, is the public good. The, uh, there are millions of people who have suffered less or lived longer because of patents that were developed in academia. And um, I think that you can probably agree that in the research that you do, you would like someday for that to lead to some therapeutic outcome that will reduce suffering or save lives. And um, patents create the financial incentives that encourage businesses to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in clinical testing, uh, seeking FDA approval, and building factories to manufacture new drugs, and uh, marketing them to pharmacies and physicians to get them to the benefit of patients. Well, patents are really the key, and the reason that the patents, patents are so key in academic technologies is because academia always wants to publish the results of the research. So you can't rely on trade secrets like many companies might. You really have to have a patent which allows you to both tell the world about your invention while at the same time retaining the economic value of it and creating the incentives for companies to develop them into products. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, the a patent incentivizes companies to, uh, to invest because they get to stop other people from competing with them in the marketplace for a period of time, which allows them to recoup their investment and make a good profit. When academic institutions I talk about licensing, and the license is essentially um, an agreement under which you agree to allow the company to use your invention in exchange for them paying you a certain uh, payments, such as royalties, which might be a certain uh, five or six percent of whatever uh, that whatever their sales is, they would pay to the patent owner as compensation. Uh, when they know that others can't compete with them in the sale of that particular product for a number of years, they can count on the profits to make it worth, worth the risk to invest in bringing that technology forward. Reason number seven is that some patents, now it's, uh, as I say, it's, this is an out of the park home run, but they happen and they can be really transformative for an institution. And I'll give you a few examples. In 1944, Selman Waxman at Rutgers discovers streptomycin. And uh, he, uh, it ultimately was the magic bullet that eradicated tuberculosis as a scourge on mankind. It was also effective against typhoid, cholera, and bubonic plague, which, also, which um, you don't hear much about today because of streptomycin and its successor antibiotics. In fact, Selman Waxman actually coined the term antibiotic uh, because it was really the first. Uh, he was no awarded the Nobel Prize for his work in 1952. Um, interesting that the patent, he was work worked with uh, some of the people at Merck to do some of the testing on his drug, and he agreed early on that he would give Merck ownership of the patent. Well, when Merck realized what they had, and its importance, not only financially, but its importance to mankind. Mark went back to Rutgers and said, gee, uh, Dr. Waxman shouldn't have assigned these patent rights to us. We're going to give them back to Rutgers, but we would like you to give us at least a non-exclusive license so that we can help uh, cure tuberculosis, which they did. And they also licensed it to several other companies because the demand was so huge. And ultimately, uh, the revenues from the, uh, from the uh, licensing of the streptomycin patent was, were put into an endowment, uh, the Re Rutgers Research and Educational Endowment uh, Foundation. And uh, its endowment uh, did a number of things, including constructing the Waxman Institute of Microbiology, which is today uh, a very active uh, and interesting uh, research center in microbiology and molecular biology. The, uh, it actually was the very first building that was constructed on what is now the Bush campus that has probably 50 science buildings on it. Um, Robert Horton at Florida State was a chemist. And he set out with a, to prove the structure of this new cancer drug, Taxol, by making it from scratch. 
it's an enormous molecule and um, extremely complex. The, the taxol had been under development for a very long time, and uh, it seemed to kill cells by forcing the cells to make too, much, too many microtubules and basically clogging up the machinery of the cells, a very unique mechanism uh, for a cancer drug. And it was a, turned out to be effective against many cancers that were completely recalcitrant against other, other cancer drugs at the time. Um, it was very expensive and in short supply because you had to use, use, extract it from the bark of the yew tree and you killed the trees when you took the bark. So um, it became, that was a real problem. Well, well, Horton, he really just set out to solve the structure of this thing. And chemists really only believe the structure that you've deduced is correct once you've been able to chemically synthesize it through steps that you control. And he did. And the yield was something like 0.0001%. This is just completely, uh, it proved the structure, but it was completely useless as a uh, manufacturing process for taxol. However, he realized that there was a precursor to taxol in the leaves of the yew tree. And he came up with a fairly simple step uh, process to uh, convert this precursor in the leaves into taxol. And the leaves, you can take as many leaves as you like it and they'll grow back. So this dramatically changed the availability of this important cancer drug. And uh, Needless to say, the patent on this manufacturing process generated a lot of revenues for Florida State University. Um, Horton also later started a company called Taxilog, which currently has some very exciting derivatives under development. The royalties on uh, Taxol uh, were generally in the neighborhood of $150 million a year. And I think the patent had about eight years left to run by the time it was commercialized. And one of the things they did was, with the money, is they put up a new chemistry building, uh, which is really focused on, um, on pharmaceutical chemistry and um, understanding mechanisms of disease and how drugs can be designed uh, to solve them. And then uh, last but not least, and this is one that our development office would really like to read about, uh, Jan Vilsick was one of the inventors of Remicade, where I pointed out that NYU sold their patent, their royalty stream on Remicade for $680 million, or $640 million. And Jan Vilsick, like inventors in pretty much every academic institution, got a share of that money as a royalty, as his inventor's share of the royalties. And uh, he recently made a donation of $105 million to NYU uh, to support its ongoing research programs, which followed an earlier $21 million donation that he made uh, for scholarships in chemistry. Uh, so not only can patents generate substantial wealth for institutions, they can also create substantial wealth for individuals who some of whom, like Jan Vilsick, can put that money back into academic research and further advance science. So what does all this mean for the Salk Institute? How does this translate? Well, when it comes to funding research, Salk is pretty much in the same boat as everybody else. Uh, the NIH budget, uh, um, the slow erosion of the NIH budget affects SALT just like it does other institutions. And although SALT science is extremely competitive for grant funds, unfortunately NIH uh, feels they have an obligation to spread the money around, so it's not always easy to get the funds even if you have a high score. So um, patent income, if we can generate substantial amounts of it, can provide increased research support and we also can use some of these inventions to attract additional research funding from corporations who see the commercial potential in some of the technologies that we're developing. Now there's a certain dilemma when it comes to the Salk vaccine that you can't help but think about. Uh, Jonas Salk was asked whether he had a patent on uh, the vaccine and he said, why? No, the patent belongs to the public. He says, could you patent the sun? 
and in other uh, interviews, he said he considered the, uh, the salt vaccine to be his gift to the children of the world. Well, how do you reconcile that with the idea that we're going to patent things and license them and generate money doing it? Isn't that kind of running contrary to his spirit? Well, I think things were different than back then. Again, polio was a scourge. And it, it's a solution to uh, polio was of such incredible importance that companies would invest in making and selling the vaccine even in the absence of a patent to protect them from competition. Um, that is not very likely today. Um, back then, getting technologies through the FDA was much easier. Uh, it was very easy in those days to uh, go down to the local prison and you could pay people pay prisoners $10 to test your new drug. Uh, obviously, we don't do it that way anymore. So uh, today, it's estimated that it costs about $400 million to bring a new drug to market. Um, if you don't have a patent, it's very unlikely today that anybody is going to invest that kind of money in getting a drug approved when all of their competitors can then come knock on the FDA's door and say, hey, we'd like to sell that stuff too. There's just no way for them to recoup that investment. So we can't really say <clears throat> what Jonas Salk's view of the world today would be, but I don't think there's any doubt that he believed in the power of science to reduce human suffering. And I think that uh, patents are a mechanism today that allow academic institutions like the Salk Institute to make that happen. But in order to, make, to have <clears throat> valuable technologies here patented and licensed and brought to the patient bedside <clears throat> in a large measure is dependent upon the knowledge of people like you about patents, patentability, and the patent system and what we can do with them. Uh, the more knowledge we can give you uh, can help you produce not only new inventions, but inventions on which we can get stronger patents, which will provide greater incentives for industry to invest in commercializing them. Um, and the increased exposure uh, that we can give you by giving seminars like this will help you to understand a bit more how industry might view patents as an attractive thing to encourage them to invest in funding research at the Institute. I'll give you a little example of the kind of information that can really be powerful in the hands of those of you who, who are at the lab bench. Um, when you're developing a model system or elucidating a pathway, um, sometimes just a few more experiments can lead to much greater patent value. So you might have a, uh, if you've elucidated a pathway, you might say, okay, well, I've got a great, assay here that you could use to screen for drugs. And we could file a patent application on a method of screening for drugs, but quite frankly, nobody's going to pay you very much for that because your patent, they can go ahead and do it without a license to your patent until the patent issues, which in biotech is going to take about five years, and quite frankly, they'll be finished their screening by then. So it's hard to make any, any royalty income or have an impact by just having an assay. On the other hand, if you say, okay, well, I've got this, this assay that would be great for screening drugs, and I know the mechanisms that are going on here, I'm going to go pull out a couple dozen compounds and test them and see if I can actually sh demonstrate that a therapeutic effect would occur by adding some to some samples and looking at the results. If you find one drug or one chemical that makes a difference, or maybe it's, an maybe it's an antibody, or maybe it's an siRNA. Um, but if you can show that by perturbing that system, you're going to have a therapeutic effect, then we can get a patent on a method of treatment, say a method of treating, uh, method of treating diabetes by administering um, uh, an inhibitor of this particular enzyme. Then if, if a company comes along and wants to commercialize that, they may come up with a specific drug that's far better than what you had, but they still have to have a license to your patent because you have a patent on the method of using such a drug to treat diabetes. 
the, um, of course, if you can go one step further and actually find a good, a good drug compound or series of compounds that, uh, that is active, then you can get an even stronger patent, the composition of matter patent. Um, the, another thing that is important for, for you to know is when, when it comes to inventing new drugs, whoever walks into the chemical closet and picks a bottle up off the shelf and says, I think this could be used to treat cancer. If that turns out, the, you've already made the invention. And if somebody else does the test, it doesn't matter. You're still the only inventor. Um, because the, the invention and concep uh, conception and reduction to practice of the invention occur in your hand when you take that bottle off the shelf. And it doesn't matter if you take one bottle off the shelf or you take 10,000 bottles off the shelf. You're still the sole inventor of the use of each and every one of those compounds to treat cancer. And so if you do, do, do test some compounds and find some that have value, if you send it off to somebody else and let them do the screening, then they're going to be the inventors and they're going to own the patents. But if you've done some of that selection yourself, then you'll be the inventor. Um, if you can't find one that's very good, but you find something that works just a little bit, then we can get a method of treatment claim, which also can have tremendous commercial value. A good example was when I was at University of Virginia, we had a patent on a method of uh, treating supraventricular tachycardia, which is a uh, fatal heart arrhythmia, by injecting a bolus of adenosine directly into the heart. And uh, adenosine was a compound known for, for decades. So adenosine was not patentable. But a method of treating tachycardia with adenosine was patentable. And we licensed that to a company. And it was generated 5 to $10 million in royalties on a very regular basis throughout its patent life. So um, these are th the kinds of things that we hope that through this seminar series and other uh, talks that we'll be able to help you get a greater understanding of that's going to help you to think in the lab, OK, now I've made these basic science discoveries. Is there something here that could take it one step further? Um, one of the things that I think people in basic science, they say, well, you know, that's, uh, that, that commercial stuff, it's all, it's all about profits. And I don't really have that mindset. You don't really have to have a profit orientation to understand that other people are motivated by profits. And so if you can do that one experiment that creates a patent that motivates profit-minded people to put their money into bringing it to the patient bedside, you may actually, uh, first of all, make sure that a product gets to the market and that your, te that your technology isn't just lost in textbooks. But also, you may you may accelerate the advance of treatment for that particular disease by decades by having a patent that will encourage somebody to take a look at this compound now. So these are the kinds of things that we hope that we can help you to appreciate over the course of uh, these seminars and, and other conversations. So I hope you'll please come back. Uh, we'll, we've got, I think I've got about seven, uh, seven seminars that have kind of outlined, uh, each on a slightly different topic having to do with patents, licensing, startup companies, and commercialization. And um, we would like to share that information with you. And uh, we're also listening. If you have any thoughts uh, uh, about technologies you're working on, what the patent potential might be, um, uh, what companies might be interested in the kinds of things you're working on, or if you'd like to comment on how our office runs, the kinds of information that we provide you, how we could do a better job, how we could make your job easier, we're all ears. We'd like to hear those comments because we're really building a program that is going to serve you and helping you create value that can lead to cures and perhaps have a transformative effect on the research funding future for the Institute. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Art, is lunch here? OK. Um, yes, questions? I send out three agents for my boss. So we, we throw in an MTA, and it usually comes back, and you know, it's a lot of traffic. But what you were saying at the very beginning that 
uh, you can have a novel patent or a change to that patent is allowable. So if I send out something to an outside company, we'll just say for kicks in the United States, and they change it, that's their patent then, right? Is right. It? So what's the point in doing the MTA on a reagent that they're going to change anything? Well, um, MTAs generally are for things that aren't patented. Now, sometimes you have a patented, a patented cell line or patented antibody, uh, but very often they're things that aren't patented. They're just research reagents. Um, and if you, and sometimes a company just says, well, we think that this, we've got a drug candidate, we think this is how it's working, we need some of your cells to test that. And in that case, they're pretty much just going to use it for internal research purposes. Um, if they, if they want to use it to create uh, derivatives that they can then turn around and sell, that's a different kind of an agreement. So we would enter into a license agreement with them that would say, we're allowing you to use this to make derivatives, and then you can sell those derivatives. You'll pay us a royalty on the sales of the derivatives. And if you found out that they had made a derivative, would the MTA have any value then at all? It depends have... on what the MTA says. Um, if the if the MTA says that uh, that we own this cell line and any derivatives you may make, then you know it'll have a, have a real impact. Uh, on the other hand, it may not say that. And sometimes it really, it's really a, um, I don't know if any of you know Pam, but uh, Pam Bach handles all of our MTAs, and and she's pretty good at ferreting ferreting out which ones are ones that have substantial commercial value and which ones are kind of just ordinary research reagents and they get treated differently. Any other question? Yes. Uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but what I heard is um, if you have uh, something possibly patentable, um, don't publish that data. Is that true or not? Uh, no, it's not true. The, um, the rule is that uh, there are really two different rules. In the United States, you can publish uh, your invention, and you have one year from the date of publication to file a patent application in one year. However, in every other country in the world, the day that your invention is published, it's no longer patentable. So <clears throat> it doesn't mean that you can't publish, but if you want to be able to retain worldwide patent rights, You've got to file your patent application before you publish. And that's usually not a problem because um, we have, since 1995, we've had something called a provisional patent application. Uh, patent application is a very formally structured document, um, usually written by lawyers at uh, substantial expense. A provisional patent application has very few uh, format requirements, content requirements. Uh, and very often, if you have a manuscript that you're going to submit for publication, if you tell us about it and we look at it, we say, yeah, there's an invention in here, we can use that manuscript and have our attorneys file a provisional patent application in a matter of a week or two. Uh, or you know, if worse comes to worse, we could do it in a day to get something in the patent office. And then once you have a provisional application or any application in a patent office in one country, such as the United States, then the, um, there's a treaty, an international treaty, under which that counts as a filing date in all other countries. So you have a year from that date to file equivalent patent applications elsewhere in the world, and they're all considered as having been filed on the, on the original date. Yeah. Okay, and again, the rules in the U.S. And, and elsewhere are different. So if you get up and give a talk at a conference um, and uh, you don't have any handouts, under US law, that's not considered a publication. Because under US law, a publication is, is only if the invention is disclosed in a printed publication or a tangible media, such as putting it on the web. Oral presentations don't count. In, the rest of the world, however, oral presentations are considered publications. And if you haven't, haven't filed a patent application and get up and give a talk, 
you're lo you've lost all of your patent rights in what you've just what you describe everywhere in the world except in the U.S. Yes. What's happening if you license your patent to a company and the company goes out of business? What happens to your, uh, with your patent? So if you license your patent to a company and the company goes out of business, um, there's actually a, s a special set of rules in the, in the bankruptcy laws that deal with that. So when a company goes out of business, I mean, if the company simply liquidates, they, they don't owe anybody any money. They just basically say, we're done. Uh, we're going to give the investors back whatever money they had and we'll disappear. Usually the patent, the, the license vanishes with the company and then you can go license it to somebody else. If they go to a bankruptcy court because they have debts and they have assets that the court is going to oversee the sale of the assets and give the money to whoever they owe money to, um, the bankruptcy judge has two choices with your license. The bankruptcy judge can either say, look, your license is key to the survival of this company. We're trying to reorganize this company. So we are going to affirm the license. We're going to pay you all outstanding debts and we're going to keep making all the payments, but the company is going to keep the license. Or the judge can say, that license, we don't want it anymore. We're canceling the license. And when it comes to getting paid whatever the company owes you, you can get in line with everybody else. So those, that's how patent licenses are handled in, uh, in bankruptcy. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. Is Salk seeking any sort of more global uh, type of relationship, such as the one that Scripps has had in the past? Um, or are you working just individually with uh, different discoveries made here? Uh, yeah, we are looking for those kinds of relationships. We, we have a similar relationship <coughs> with, um, escapes me, with, with, with Sanofi. Um, uh, Sanofi is, is supporting a considerable amount of research in, um, in stem cells. And uh, we are certainly actively looking for other uh, substantial research relationships like that. And I think, you know, the research at Salk is quite exemplary and a lot of companies are interested in what we're doing. It's just a matter of finding a comp the companies that have, uh, have the, um, the interest in supporting research and see the product opportunity that relates to the research that we do. And generally those things include uh, some kind of a, a licensing arrangement so that if inventions are made in the course of the research they're funding, that uh, they'll get a license to that and be the ones that get to, to develop those products. Yeah, it's usually, a, uh, it's usually an, uh, an option to take a license. And the option lasts for a certain period and if they decide they want a license during that period, then we, then we negotiate a license. A right of first refusal is actually something different. A right of a first refusal says, well, um, I've offered you this deal. You said no. Well, now I go and offer a different deal to somebody else. But before I can do that deal with them, I have to come back to you and ask you if you want it. Right. And a lot of that depends on the amount of money that you get from yeah. the outside. But it's a... Uh, a right of first refusal can become a difficult beast to manage because it's hard to get people to negotiate with you if they know somebody else can steal the deal out from, out from under them. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, do you have a, um, something like a list of the inventions, so take an invention from SOC in kind of a website? So because uh, yeah, if you go to our website, there's a list of all of the inventions that are available for license. Um, another easy way to look at Salk's patents is to go to the Patent and Trademark Office website at USPTO.gov and um, if you just, you can search for the assignee or the owner and just search for inventions that are owned by the Salk Institute and you get a whole list, links to individual patents so that you can uh, go and read them. So yeah, you can learn a lot about our patents off the web. The uh, <coughs> Patent Office database has not only uh, issued patents, but also patent applications. Under the law today, uh, when you file a patent application, 18 months after you file, the patent office publishes it for public comment and inf inf information. And so though any patent applications we have that are more than 18 months old will also be on the uh, database at the patent office. Yeah. 
how, how do we reconcile our nonprofit status with the income that we generate for something that we have? Uh, we can thank the, uh, University, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation that has had multiple battles with the IRS over that. <laughs> and uh, the, um, the rule is uh, that you, you have to pay taxes on quote unquote unrelated business income. So for example, if, uh, if the Salk Institute um, were to uh, I don't know, we probably contract out for our cafeteria services. But if the Salk Institute ran a cafeteria and it was, it was a, pro, a profitable enterprise, you'd have to pay tax on the, on the profits from that because it's not related to your core function, to your, to your, to your nonprofit function. Uh, but the IRS has, has ultimately concluded that um, patenting inventions and collecting royalties is not unrelated to the research enterprise. Uh, particularly because under Salk's patent policy and the patent policy in most places, the proceeds from the, uh, the royalties get reinvested in the research program and in, in the facilities that are used for nonprofit purposes. Yeah. Just a question on procedure. Say I'm a grad student or a postdoc at the bottom of the food chain here. I have the idea which eventually leads to a patent and some income uh, do I benefit from that? Or is it Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, the, um, yeah, the policy just says that there's an, an inventor's share of the royalties, and the inventor's share of the royalties gets paid to the inventors. <clears throat> if, if there's only one inventor and the inventor happens to be a graduate student, then they get the whole inventor's share. Um, more often, you have joint inventions where you have you have a postdoc, a grad student, and a PI are all co-inventors on it. And uh, one of the things that I'm planning to do shortly is to modify our invention disclosure form so that people, when they send in a disclosure, they can indicate what their relative contributions to the invention were. And I think at that time, you're, when the invention's just been made, is a good time for people to think about that. Uh, and then to put down the percentages of of contributions so that later when royalties come in, the inventor's share will be divided amongst the joint inventors according to what they agreed to. Uh, but yeah, just, it doesn't matter uh, you know, if, you're, if you're a lab tech uh, or an administrator, if you make an invention, you're still gonna get the, uh, entitled to your fair inventor's share. Uh, I'm getting the signal that the food is here. So I'm gonna, uh, Right, give you an opportunity to go get some food. <clears throat> I'm happy to, uh, I'll be here for the next hour, to, happy to continue answering questions. Um, I've got a couple of slides that I can show you on an interesting Supreme Court case that just uh, was decided in the last week or so, uh, dealing with university inventions. So uh, come on back. Thanks.